Hey there, internet friends. This is Alexander Williamson with The Secret History Living in Your Aquarium. So this is going to be a deep dive today about Cory Doris uh, barbell rot or erosion. Uh, when, when the whiskers or onodontodes on their face, when they get mangled, when they get swollen, discolored, when they turn white or red, they get blisters on them, or they even get rubbed all the way off, we're going to be talking about how that happens, why that happens. And it turns out, I've been hearing a debate for decades on why this happens. Is it because of sharp substrate? Is it because of fungi? Is it because of nitrates in the water? Is it because of them burrowing and looking for food? What What is it? And it turns out that science actually has an answer to all of these questions, as well as the structure of those whiskers or onodontodes or barbels, as they're properly called, and what they look like at a cellular level, what they do, and now even we have information on how they're fed to the Corydoras' brain, and so what's going on, what they're used for, how they evolved. All this information is there for the public, and I have cited it in the description below if you care to read it on your own, but we're going to be talking about all these factors and how you can prevent these things from happening to your Corydora, but also how, if you do have the misfortune of this occurring, how you can treat it as well. But first, before all of that, we're going to go into a little bit of background on biology, physiology. We're going to look at some Corys, and we're going to just kind of talk about how this occurs because of their natural behavior, how they've evolved. So I will meet you on the inside. If you guys find this interesting, you like these deep dives, uh, please consider subscribing, consider uh, pressing that like button, and if you're uh, really feeling uh, frisky, uh, you can share it if you'd like. So we're going to talk about one of the biggest myths, misconceptions, or really kind of rumors that goes around this hobby and sort out fact from fiction. So I'll meet you guys inside. All right, everybody, now we're inside and we're looking at a Corydoras Aeneas. And that is the orange Corydor Corydoras Venezueliana is the other name it has, but an awesome little fish. Now, the first thing we need to talk about is Loricaridae in general. So that's plecos, that's catfish of all sorts that are in uh, this grouping and they have very similar anatomies by having those whiskers. Now on, on uh, plecos, they're gonna be called uh, either barbels or onodontodes. The onodontodes are generally what we see in things like the bushy nose plecos, and some of these are not covered completely in sensors, but rather are more ornamental to show off for spawning and mating reasons. Now, another thing that we'll need to take note of is the variety we have in the hobby of these fish. For instance, here is a blue-eyed albino ancestress. Albinos are something that wouldn't exist for long in nature. And honestly, they get picked off by predators very quickly. However, in this hobby, people really like the bright white fish and so they've become very common. And when being bred in mass numbers, it's not necessarily their health that they're most concerned about. So keep that in mind as we're talking about some of the uh, human-made varieties of uh, Corydoras, like the long fin varieties and the color morphs that are uh, domestic bred. So. First of all, we need to talk about the anatomy. And when we talk about them, we can talk about their whiskers or their barbels. Uh, but barbel is the term you're going to come across in all of the uh, scholarly articles and journals that discuss uh, the anatomy of these fish. So be it a pleco like this one here, or the bushy nose, or our happy little Corydora here. Hey, get out of the way, angelfish. So um, what you can see, first of all, is that they use those barbels just like hands almost. They manipulate their food with them, they, they kind of taste with them, and they also use them to feel surfaces and to navigate. Now, 
catfish in general have been studied a whole lot because, and this is going to relieve those of you who came here to learn about the barbel erosion and what to do, they have a regenerative ability. And a lot of fish have a regenerative ability in their fins and other parts of their bodies. However, the barbels are such an important part of these fish that if they couldn't regenerate them, they would simply die most likely. They couldn't find their next meal and they couldn't sense predators or mating partners and all sorts of things. So they're really important and that's why they evolve the ability to regenerate them. Now, there are over 800 species and varieties of Corydoras in the wild, and there are a lineage of them going back with a common ancestor to almost 60 million years ago. So it's a body design and a anatomical biological lay. Um, <laughs> layout that really works for them. So you can see here, he's he's searching that leaf there, and they're able to sense with those uh, barbels, they're able to sense the pressure in the water, the temperature of the water, how much the water's moving around them, on which side of them. They're able to taste for fats, for lipids, uh, you know, like fatty proteins in the water, for blood in the water, for detritus, and even for specific chemicals that are associated with rotting or certain algaes. So they've specialized, and each species is going to be a little different on what they can sense within those, but they all have evolved these really unique cells. And in fact, all catfish have these taste buds, so to speak, across their entire body. So let's go look at another catfish just to show you another example of this. So another catfish that you guys may know is an African catfish, so it's gonna be quite a bit different evolutionarily speaking, but it still has those long whiskers. We'll see it in a sec, I'm sure. Uh, this is a Petricola synodonis, uh, and you can see those big white, very prominent whiskers that it uses for sensing all the same stuff that the Corydoras are sensing in the wild. So, that's one thing, and you guys need to understand that that is how they navigate their world, all these catfish. Oftentimes they're in really murky conditions, and they're going to be feeling around with those and for the water pressure and things around them by using those for meals, for danger, and for, you know, when it's safe, when they can relax. Now, beyond this, we also need to understand that Corydoras are a special kind of catfish. Corydoras are a variety that has something unique going on. So, even the small species of Corydoras have a kind of cool feature, which is armor. And in fact, a lot of the Greek and Latin names and the name uh, of Corydoras itself means helmet or armor, uh, plated or covered. And it has these basically uh, keratin and other, uh, there's other compounds in there too, but it's, uh, it's keratin, like our fingernails, uh, and sometimes cartilage or bone, depending on if we're talking about uh, the, the spikes they have in their fins and the, uh, the uh, other features they have, like the ability to have a venom gland underneath their pectoral fins, they then have a kind of V-shaped uh, little spear that's at the front of that fin, which you can kind of see here, and that's so they can stab predators and release venom into the water and then into the predator. So they've evolved uniquely, but what's important to realize about this is that they're not the same as all these other fish, that when they have a problem, all these fleshy fish and fish covered in little scales, they have the ability to have a slime coat that protects them a lot better and they have the ability to basically ball up mucus just like when we have a runny nose and allergies and get rid of bacteria and fungi and little pathogens and parasites with the slime on their body as well as they have antibacterial and antifungal properties built in right into their slime coat 
So it's really important to keep up this slime coat. And we'll talk about that at the end in some of the preventative measures for if you are trying to prevent this or if you're treating it. In either way, it'll be important. But on the Corydoras, you may not see little lesions and issues that are going on that would tell you of a problem. And these fish have been studied so much due to their regenerative abilities in the Corydoras, that is, that they've been in labs and scientists have sat there and observed them and tried to figure out what is it that makes them lose their fins or their barbels or their color or their eyesight and all sorts of things have been studied because they want to see if it's something that they could apply to human biology as well as I'm sure it's just pretty interesting to ichthyologists so when we're talking about these fish we may not see those infections that are coming on in their bodies and oftentimes these infections set in in those onodontodes because they're using them basically like little hands or feet or tongues or mouths you know they use them on everything and because of that they can get nicked or they can just get a little micro cut that is you know too small to even see and after that happens you'll end up getting an infection now their slime coat if they're healthy should handle that but if they're stressed or there's nitrates in the water or there's just a whole lot of the fungus or bacteria that's doing damage to them in the water then sometimes they can't overcome it and it will inf infect and impact those barbels like these ones here so different species have different lengths different sizes and and different configurations of them you can see on their nose they've also got soft tissue but preventatively you want to look at the soft tissue like the fins the mouth and the eyes and make sure there's no red lesions or sores or chunks missing it could be that they got in a fight with another fish or something but more than likely with the corydora uh, as long as it's in a peaceful environment uh, from threats it's probably going to be a bacterial or fungal infection that's causing those issues and because of the plates that we see see those going all down the back those are much less likely to show up as a big sore unless the the fish really gets injured or chomped into by another fish or cut open so we let these things go and the same with Corydora's abilities to gulp air they can actually uh, over the last 40 million years they've had the ability in muddy waters to go to the surface and gulp air so you can actually tell oftentimes a happy healthy Corydora oftentimes will go up to the surface dart up and come right back down they're gulping air and in their stomach they're able to absorb that air and put it into their bloodstream and use it just as if it were lungs which is pretty cool so when studying the Corydoras for regenerative effects of their tissue one of the things that they learned all the way back in 1925 was that when they lose a barbel they actually regrow it a very specific way in every species of catfish the way that they regrow it is they grow a basal or basal blood supply first and then they grow some fat and protein around that and then they'll build a cluster of little cells that are taste buds they're called taste buds or chemoreceptors and they put those all over the surface area of their barbels and as it gets bigger and grows those cells get more and more dense and they start small but get bigger and bigger and as they get bigger they'll then get covered in new skin or flesh which then those mounds will get covered in new little taste buds so that's actually layers and layers and layers of taste buds with a nerve and a, and a vein running through each one and the the nerves actually go straight to the brain and they've shown now with MRIs that they actually see what they're sensing so catfish have evolved their visual cortex with their sensory receptors so they can taste food and who knows if it's directional or if it's you know 
based on the amount of something in the environment, but whatever's happening, they see it literally in their brain as a vision. And so we can, by that, we know that it's a very, very ingrained part of their survival and of their anatomy. And when it gets injured, it's a big problem, obviously. So now to the debate that everybody's waiting for and everybody may have an opinion on who's watching this. So what is it, which substrate is causing these problems? Well, it turns out it's not any substrate that causes the problem usually. Uh, these cuts that usually instigate an infection are so small that they're not necessarily coming from sharp sand or a sharp stone or wood. It's theoretically possible that they could get a sliver and there's another circumstance where if they're in an unhealthy state and they're not getting any food and there are substrates that are sharp and they're having to dig for their food every day just to get by, then they can kind of obsessively do that and that is when actually sharp substrates are an issue. But if you feed your fish properly and put them in the right water conditions and the nitrates aren't super high and they have a healthy slime coat, you can put them on any substrate and they should be fine. Like I said, these fish have evolved for over 60 million years and they're very happy to be on rocks or silt or different surfaces like wood and pods of fruit and things like that and they have a very gentle touch with their uh, with their little barbels so they're not going to just hurt themselves easily and in fact one indicator if they do hurt themselves on your substrate is that they may have had a parasite in their stomach or it just may have been that you were feeding them and it wasn't the right food combination. So the best thing to be feeding them is going to be, well, live worms that are parasite free ideally and insects. But other than that, you could definitely feed them algae, spirulina algae wafers, uh, catfish designed foods for detrivores that eat stuff that is uh, basically rotting other <laughs> fish and plants. And depending on the species, you should do your research and figure out what it is that your quarry specifically eats. Or for that matter, if you're watching this for plecos too, same goes for them. Some love wood, some eat only rotting uh, fish and plants, and some only eat algae, for instance. So definitely do your research on what it is they want. But when you feed a community tank, oftentimes the more aggressive fish will dart around and they will actually get all the food. And then your bottom loving fish are only left with the little teeny pieces that fall to the bottom. And those little teeny pieces, if they're in between sharp rock, it's going to be a problem. So these fish evolved in rivers. And in rivers, the stones are going to look like these. They're going to be rounded from erosion. And the sand is going to be pretty fine and broken up. Uh, even if it is made of sharp shells and, you know, bones and other things like coral. It should be fairly smooth from that erosion. However, in our tanks, sometimes we aquascape, like I said, with things like, you know, dragonstone or black blasting sand. And those things, as well as fluorite, when they break down, they break into other sharp pieces and they just get smaller but they're still sharp and the same can be true with crushed coral and so forth uh, if it's not rolled and weathered so the fact that our aquariums don't have the full motion of a river or lake and thousands of years on their side yes they can hurt themselves and get their initial cut there however they're not going to lose their barbels from that cut. It is actually from the fungi or bacteria, of which there are about 15 that impact uh, Corydoras in particular that they've noted. And it turns out that uh, you can treat these, uh, particularly, usually with Corydoras, you can treat the uh, barbel infections with a API antifungal. That's a really common one, but any antifungal fish treatment should probably work. And then you'll also want to treat them with 
an antibacterial. Now there's two types of antibiotics and those antibiotics are gram positive and gram negative. Gram negative is going to be for internal use, for uh, low oxygen levels of bacterial. That is a rough approximation of things and uh, when you get deep into it that's not necessarily true. But for our reasons today, Think of your fish as needing gram-negative generally when they're having an internal uh, infection in their blood, in their stomach. If it's in their eyes or in their gills or somewhere that's high oxygen, then they're going to have gram-positive uh, antibiotics that they need. And so erythromycin or candomycin, uh, all those kind of things are the ones, maricin, are the ones that you can use to treat uh, their barbels. Now, in studies in the 70s, they found that their barbels actually grew back in 1.5 weeks. They started to regrow actual taste bud cells or uh, chematophores, which uh, sense different chemicals in the water. And at about four and a half weeks, usually, the Corydoras were able to function again with the same full ability to detect where the food was in the tank when they were uh, blinded or blindfolded. So they do regenerate quickly and it's because they would die with, without that ability. But that's a good thing for if your fish has this problem. It can look really bad and you can still treat it. So the first thing you're going to want to do is take it out of the tank. You're going to want to get it away from anything sharp because it's not that the sharp thing necessarily caused the problem. It's that once they're irritated, they don't have hands, they don't have fingernails or ways to scratch themselves, so they rub on any abrasive surface and make it worse. So unless it was that you th don't think your fish was getting enough food and that the other fish were out competing it and you weren't feeding it maybe large size wafers that they can kind of chomp on or veggies or algae or um, frozen bloodworms, things that they love uh, and that are soft, then it could be that they just weren't getting the flake food or granular food and they obsessively were digging. If that's the case, you may want to treat them for parasites just in case they were malnourished also because you may not know. Uh, and if they were getting food and they're obsessively digging, it could just be that they're scratching a small infection you can't see yet or it could be that they actually are going to get that infection from obsessively digging, looking for those nutrients which the parasites are taking out. So in that case, you're going to want to use something like flubendazole or um, uh, fenbendazole or levamisole really knocks things out. So that's what I would recommend you do. Now, preventative measures, one great thing you can do is put tannins in the tank. Almost all Corydoras come from a environment that is acidic to neutral and so fresh clean water changes low nitrates all that will help their slime coat heal up and it will help them uh, survive the ordeal you can also do a salt dip every other day or so and that will also cause their slime coat and uh, external uh, autoimmune system it will allow it to um, basically become triggered and a little irritated but not so much that it hurts them, but enough so that they can start to fight back. You should know if if the medication is working within that week because it should stop getting worse. It should stop getting worse within the first you know two to three days, uh, and then within a week it should have stopped, if not started to reverse and start to regrow those uh, barbels. So other than that. It's really not about the substrate. Like I said, it's about some sort of bacteria or fungus in the water that got into a teeny tiny cut or the way that their barbels are formed. Like I said, they're layered and they have a little hollow section where they hope that little chemicals will float into and dock with and it's actually pretty easy for those to get torn on a really microscopic level and because that blood source is right in there uh, flowing to those cells it's able to spread then into the other tissue very rapidly even on a very teeny scale 
So you got to treat those things and you want to give them a good balanced diet of you know, high protein to help them regenerate, but not just pure protein. Obviously, you know, some spirulina algae wafer tabs um, or some black worms and, and blood worms would be a great choice. You want to probably put them in a tank on their own, uh, in a smaller tank, something like a two or five gallon. If you're really in a tough situation, you can always use, you know, a Tupperware or a bowl, put an air stone in it and a little air pump. Uh, and that will work in a pinch. Like I said, they can go to the surface and gulp for air if the water doesn't have enough air for their taste. So, I hope you guys have learned something about this, and it's interesting to me that everybody argues, oh, it's, it's blasting sand, oh, it's coral, it's crushed coral, it's uh, dragonstone, it's granite, whatever they say it is that's causing this problem in our Corridoras, that's not the cause of the problem. It is more of a sign or a side effect from the underlying problem, which is a fungal or bacterial infection that has gotten worse and worse and you weren't able to see because it didn't show up anywhere else in their body if it spread and if it started in their barbels, then basically it's just they use them so much that it can develop rather rapidly. So I hope you guys like this deep dive. This is pretty standard on this channel where I try to go and do the research. There are about a dozen links to really cool studies that were done about these fish from all the way from the turn of the 20th century up through the last few years about the regenerative uh, capabilities of them and their brains and how well they can sense things and all sorts of cool stuff about these fish in those articles and you can get access to them I'm gonna post them in the description today but generally I post them in the community tab for all the members it's only a buck ninety nine to become a member and support the channel so I can keep doing uh, the hours of research it takes to put these videos together and share them uh, for free so if you don't have the money it's all good I, I usually will uh, release the sources later or talk about them at, at another time but the videos are always going to be available to you whether you want to support the channel monetarily or not. Just watching is a big help. So thanks for your time. I hope your fish do well. Let me know how they heal up if they were sick and that's why you ended up here. And uh, please, I'd love to hear your input and thoughts on this. I was just surprised that scientists knew so much about it and yet hobbyists spend so much time uh, kind of hypothesizing about it without citing any sources so the sources are cited in the description thank you so much for your time if you stuck around this long i probably deserve a thumbs up i would hope but if not maybe i'll earn it next time thanks again guys and i'll talk to you next time on the secret history living in your aquarium bye guys